Andrea Faro. And um, this panel um, is entitled Governance in Asia, Emerging Political Elites. I'm the moderator. My name is Wenjin Ye. I'm professor of history at uh, Berkeley and director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. For panel three, we have uh, two speakers. Let me introduce um, our first speaker, Professor Susan Shirk. Uh, Professor Shirk is uh, the Ho Mulan Professor of China and Pacific Relations at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at the University of California at San Diego. She's also the director of the system-wide University of California Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. Between 1987 and 2000, Professor Shirk served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Her responsibility included China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. In 1983, she founded and continued to lead the Northeast Asia Cooperation Dialogue, which is an unofficial track two forum for discussions of security issues among defense and foreign ministry officials and academics from the United States, Japan, China, Russia, and the two Koreas. Dr. Shirk's publications include her um, latest book, which is entitled China, Fragile Superpower, which was uh, published by Oxford University in spring 2007. And I should say that uh, when I was uh, doing my own doctoral work, I was deeply influenced by her first book entitled Competitive Comrades. Uh, she is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she's the author of uh, over at least 200 essays and public presentations. She's an emeritus member of the Aspen Strategy Group, and she's a senior advisor to the Albright Group. In that function or from that position, she advises private sector clients on China and East Asia. So uh, she's our first speaker, please. Well, thank you very much. It's uh uh, a great treat and an honor to be here today. Uh, of course, I'm always happy to come to a celebration of Bob Scalapino's career. Um, I was a student here at Berkeley. I did a master's degree before going to MIT. Um, and as people were describing how uh, divided the department was, and you know, it was like Red Guard factions right in the uh, political science department at Berkeley, which explains why I went to MIT, actually, um, where things were a lot quieter for a while. Um, but Bob also was kind of my partner in developing the Northeast Asia Cooperation Dialogue, and he participated in that track two six-party forum from the very first in 1993. So I always say, I want to be Bob Scalapino when I grow up. Um, well, today, though, I get to talk about domestic politics, which is great. I really enjoy that uh, a lot. Uh, and I'm going to make a few remarks about the daunting challenge that the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party face in sustaining uh, Communist Party rule into the future. They look out their window of Jungnan High and they see a society that has been drastically transformed by the market reform and opening uh, since the end of 1978. Chinese society, Chinese population is a lot more mobile, uh, a lot more better informed. Uh, they go back and forth and travel abroad. Um, so for the Chinese Communist Party to try to sustain its authority and the support of the public and maintain what, of course, they euphemistically describe as political stability, 
uh, is really not an easy thing. And I think uh, there are many of us who predicted that things were going to change a lot more drastically than they actually have. So now we're all studying what is the source of resilience of CCP rule. Now, uh, so today I just want to make a few remarks about the kinds of uh, governance reforms that have been undertaken uh, at two levels. First of all, at the mass level, the question of how to maintain popular support and prevent large-scale civil unrest, and then second, at the elite political level, because after 1989 crisis, uh, it seems to me that China's leaders concluded that in order to remain in power, in order to keep the party in power, they had to do three things. First, they had to prevent widespread political unrest. Second, they had to prevent splits, public splits in the leadership that might embolden the public to, uh, uh, to protest and to uh, attack the party in ways that become actually revolutionary. And third, they had to keep the military loyal. And uh, the third one I'm not going to talk about. We really talked about that more this morning. But instead, I'll take the slice of how do we maintain popular support? How do we demonstrate that the party is responsive and prevent large-scale unrest? And then the question of how to prevent public splits in the leadership. So. Um, now, they have to do all that, of course, without actually introducing electoral accountability because they're afraid to introduce electoral accountability because that includes the risk of actually getting voted out of power. So uh, therefore, this is really, uh, you know, we talk about innovation. This is very interesting. This is kind of a laboratory of non-electoral mechanisms to improve governance. And I dare say that we really don't have a good idea yet of how successful these mechanisms are or aren't. And you know, I know my own instinct as a Westerner uh, is to say, well, of course, they can never succeed because without electoral accountability, none of this stuff will really work. But I think we have to take what they're doing seriously and examine the experiments um, on the merits. And uh, Asia Foundation is undertaking a very interesting empirical research project in conjunction with partners in China doing serious empirical social science to evaluate the results of some of these uh, experiments in governance. And just even the fact that these uh, party-affiliated think tanks are willing to learn some of these modern social science approaches to actually do this research is pretty remarkable in and of itself, I would say. And I'm pleased that I'm playing a, a little role in, in that project. So uh, the greatest problem, I would say, that the uh, party leaders face in regard to uh, governance at the mass level is how to monitor provincial and local officials in order to get them to actually carry out central policies that are supposed to be in the interests of people. And this is one of the greatest paradoxes of contemporary Chinese politics, is here you have a hierarchy in which everybody's job depends upon the party officials at higher levels. Um, the party still controls all appointments of government officials. Um, and yet, Beijing still can't get provincial and lower level officials to carry out their policies. And this is even after 1994, when you had a fiscal recentralization. So, this is a paradox. It's a puzzle that I would say we still don't completely understand. 
but it points out the difficulty that people like Kevin O'Brien have identified of how do you uh, get policy implementation in this kind of system? How does Beijing monitor what is going on so far away in provincial capitals and below? Now, um, it's pretty obvious, and those of you who are political scientists studying China, you know that local officials don't spend enough on health education, pensions, environmental protection, air and water pollution. And Beijing wants them to do more, to put more effort into these areas because they understand that people, increasingly middle class people, especially in the cities, really care about this stuff. And uh, if the local officials don't follow the policy, then you there is the risk of political upheaval. But the local officials continue to pursue their own individual interests, which they define as achieving high growth rates, um, meeting the hard target of growth, and also building flashy uh, vanity projects that make them look like um, big, important people in their local communities, and incidentally also gives them the opportunity to line their pockets with payoffs from construction companies. So um, what has Beijing done? And if you look at a lot of the uh, governance innovations, if you will, I think they are really primarily designed to find ways of monitoring uh, local officials in a more effective manner. So uh, they involve all sorts of ways of getting feedback on the job performance of officials without, without actually having them stand for election. Uh, people can introduce lawsuits against the government. There are public hearings, public comment on all new regulations. The new open information um, regulations um, and, of course, what I'm particularly interested in is the media, that uh, the Chinese government has really had to open up the possibility of media supervision, create watchdog media. Of course, there's censorship, but still, in certain areas, especially ones like environment, like food and medicine quality, where public uh, dissatisfaction could be really very politically dangerous. They have pretty much given the media carte blanche to uh, serve as fire alarms to flag emerging problems uh, so that then the government can try to fix the problems before they stir up too much public unrest. And in the process, of course, of especially introducing these governance experiments, what they're doing is inculcating the norms of transparency, rule of law, and democracy. You do searches on all of those topics, you're going to find a lot of discussion in uh, the public domain in China about these. And sometimes I wonder if by having to turn to the toolkit of democratic governance without actually introducing a lot of the real institutional accountability, they are kind of laying the groundwork for a normative challenge, a real fundamental challenge on the part of an opposition movement that says, well, you talk a lot about all this stuff, now we're the ones who want to actually deliver it to the Chinese people. Um, at the elite level, how do you prevent public uh, leadership splits that could signal that it's safe to come out and demonstrate uh, and challenge the government? Uh, this is perhaps an even more daunting challenge because most communist authoritarian regimes, and in fact, most well, especially communist ones, have fallen top down, not bottom up. It's really splits at the top that bring about regime change. 
So when you look at elite politics in China, you can see some pretty significant changes from the Mao era, some of which involve basically going back to 1956, and some of which are really new. Uh, the regularization of the meeting schedules of the leadership bodies of the Communist Party, uh, the fact that you have job slot representation in the Central Committee, the Politburo, um, which means that if you get appointed a certain position as a minister or a party secretary in a province, it brings with it a certain position in the party leadership organs. It's a way of maintaining a balance of these institutional constituencies at the top of the Communist Party. Then, of course, you have um, term limits, retirement age that create a more stable ladder of success. And you have a whole succession protocol. Of course, the most dramatic achievement of this regularization or institutionalization of leadership politics is the peaceful handover of power from Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao, which is the first time that this had ever occurred in a large communist country. And it basically looks as if now Xi Jinping is following more or less the same succession protocol and will be taking over in 2012. So is this good enough? In other words, the governance, uh, the elite, the, the regularization or institutionalization of elite politics, is this good enough to guarantee that there will not be public leadership splits that could help uh, catalyze more fundamental political change. The biggest danger I see is that uh, right now, all of those changes are in the context of a complete ban on reporting anything about elite decision making and elite politics. One of the great anomalies if you look at greater China, is that in Hong Kong, they've been reporting more or less accurately about elite politics in uh, Beijing for decades. And yet just over the border in the PRC, it is absolutely taboo to uh, discuss elite politics. And how long, in the context of this market-oriented media and the internet pluralism that exists, can you really uh, prevent this wall uh, from being breached so that reporting and leaks about what's going on inside the inner circle will start to get reported? Um, and of course, right now, since Wen Jiabao gave his remarks about democratization a few months ago, uh, and Hu Jintao's comments were much more lukewarm, you might say, uh, a lot of people in China are, are speculating that there is some division at the top about the prospects for political reform. Who knows? But once you start to see those differences, that really is potentially quite dangerous. The other thing that is a kind of wild card is it's, it would be so easy for an individual leader or a group of leaders to reach out beyond the inner circle using the internet to try to mobilize support um, among, say, rank and file party members or ordinary citizens. And yet, it hasn't happened yet, but there are some hints of it in, say, Bo Xilai's populist efforts to, to make himself into a kind of political rock star. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have a uh, reform agenda at present, really. But you can imagine that in the future, this kind of thing will be very, very difficult to prevent um, into the long-term future, especially if there were to be large-scale protests. Because once protests develop, and let's say they're in more than one city, 
then this shows that a following is already in place. And I think it's very tempting for a leader to step forward and say, I'm your leader, and let's, you know, we've waited long enough uh, to change this political system, and it's time for a change. So uh, the governance changes and reforms are very interesting. I think we need to take them seriously and study them uh, carefully and empirically. Um, and it will be, just as China's market reform was a great experiment in world history of introducing a market economy into a communist political system, now we see China introducing these uh, non-electoral governance reforms, and uh, we have a chance to see how they'll work. I'm not going to make any predictions. I've been wrong so many times in the past that uh, I don't dare make predictions about the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm this is a set it. of uh, remarks uh, that, uh, first of all, is predicated upon in, um, in affirmation of an institutionalized system of uh, elite politics with its own internal structure and incentives. And then at the same time, especially at this moment, it's getting complicated or destabilized by the irregularized flow of information uh, thanks to uh, internet technology. So that takes us once again back to the question of media and perceptions uh, issues raised this morning which is also a wonderful way for us to introduce our next speaker, Daniel Snyder. Daniel is an NARP Research Associate uh, of the year, uh, for these two years. And he's also the uh, Associate Director for Research at the uh, Water H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at uh, Stanford. His research focuses on regionalism in East Asia historical memory issues, security, and foreign policy in Japan and Korea, and current U.S. foreign and national security policy in Northeast Asia. He was the uh, longtime um, foreign correspondent, and most uh, recently, he's the foreign editor and foreign affairs columnist of the uh, San Jose Mercury News. He is the editor, um, co-author, uh, co-editor of numerous uh, volumes and uh, publications. So I won't uh, announce them all, except to say that he's the, the co-author of a forthcoming book entitled Divided Memories, History Textbooks, and the Wars in Asia. Daniel, please. Thank you, and uh, it, for me also, I, I want to thank, of course, NBR and the Wilson Center uh, uh, for giving me the uh, this honor of uh, of the fellowship, and I also want to thank the Asia Foundation for this event. And uh, I was not a student of Dr. Scalapino's, but uh, I have known him. I feel like almost all my life because he and my father were longtime friends. My father served in the Foreign Service, mainly dealing with Japan and Korea for more than 30 years. And uh, like Dr. Scalapino, he was a Japanese language officer during the war. And uh, I don't know when they first met, but I feel like he was always there. And as a journalist, I frequently sought his counsel and uh, advice. I, he, he was always uh, the, probably one of the best sources you could ever talk to about almost anything uh, having to do with Asia. So again, it's an honor for me to be here. I, I actually, I'm talking about uh, Japanese politics and its impact on Japanese foreign policy. I started following Japanese politics about uh, 35 years ago, and uh, that was a torturous experience for a long time, a little bit like, as they say, like watching paint dry uh, when you're following the politics of a, of a effectively a one-party state, uh, not like China, but one where there's the illusion of uh, perhaps of more democracy than, than really was the case. Um, it's a little, uh, searching for change was always a, a, a daunting proposition. I remember when I was sent out to cover Japan as a correspondent by the Christian Science Monitor in 1985, I, I had a final lunch meeting with the foreign editor, and he, he warned me. He said, you can only write one story a year about Japanese politics. That's it. I, I violated that rule. But uh, I, I have to say, from that point of view, 
uh, for those of us who've, who've been laboring in this vineyard for a long time, uh, the election last August uh, of the Democratic Party of Japan uh, to, uh, to govern Japan was a momentous event. I mean, it's the first time in the entirety of post-war Japanese history that an opposition party replaced uh, the ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party. And uh, I think the, the character and the, uh, of this change, and in some sense the depth of this change, has only slowly uh, been understood even by those of us who in some ways were anticipating this event or, or maybe over-anticipating this event uh, for a long time. I, I want to mainly focus on what this change means for Japanese foreign policy and particularly for the relationship between Japan uh, and the United States. Uh, I've, I, I started about two years ago, maybe this was more wish than prediction, uh, talking to uh, members of the Democratic Party of Japan, particularly Diet members, about their views on Japanese foreign policy. To some degree, I, I was anticipating that they might come to power, but I didn't think it would necessarily happen that quickly. Um, so I, and I've continued to do those interviews, even most recently, uh, just uh, last month in, in Tokyo. So I spent a lot of time talking to Diet members, looking through the DPJ's own printed documents, which are quite lengthy, and there's a lot of them on their thinking on foreign policy, and talking to the sort of foreign policy intellectuals who surround the DPJ, and they have a certain coterie of people, and going through the history of the party and how they were thinking about Japanese foreign policy from their inception. And I want to give you a little bit of what I've gleaned from that. Uh, there are two dimensions to change uh, in Japan. One is the structural and one is the I ideological. The structural, it may be in some sense even more important, although I'm not going to dwell on that. The, the, the DPJ came to power though, with a determination, this is really probably the, maybe in some ways the only unifying idea in the DPJ, uh, to diminish the role of the permanent bureaucracy in the formation of policy in Japan, particularly in the area of domestic policy, but also in the area of foreign policy. The sort of long time, what people call the Iron Triangle in Japan, the relationship between the bureaucracy, uh, the LDP, and the business elite, and I'd say the other sort of leg of that triangle, if you will, is, is the mass media elite, um, that had really uh, made policy in Japan for a long time, was the, was the enemy of the DPJ. They're determined to change the very structure of governance. Uh, and uh, that in the area of foreign policy, that meant that they came in and said that uh, they weren't basically going to listen to the foreign ministry bureaucrats, the defense ministry bureaucrats. They were going to make policy uh, on the basis of the political uh, philosophy and the uh, platforms of the party. And they came, they, they, they came in uh, determined to do that. And as a result, from, uh, from the earliest moments uh, of being in power, and I was in Tokyo in those early days, the foreign ministry bureaucrats were shut out of everything. And this is completely unheard of in, in, in Japan. And what it also happened to do was it shut down all the channels of communication that traditionally had existed between Japan and the United States. And the implications of that uh, became clear as the base crisis over the U.S. bases in Okinawa emerged. On the ideological side, um, the DPJ, since its formation in September 1996, uh, and you can track this through their uh, party platforms that they prepared for uh, every election campaign, um, had a really distinctly different view of foreign policy than the LDP. There are uh, many areas of continuation of overall consensus, but there are some distinct areas of difference. Um, since its inception, the DPJ has called for forging a more, they use the term equal partnership with the United States and putting greater emphasis on the relationship of Japan uh, with Asia, with China and Korea in particular, but also, by the way, with Russia. Uh, in the thinking of people in the DPJ leadership, Russia in some sense is sort of part of that uh, reorientation or rebalancing of, of Japanese foreign policy. That may have something to do with the fact that many of the leadership, early leadership of the DPJ come from Hokkaido, uh, where Russia is a very important issue. Uh, so um, at the same time, while they clearly supported the security alliance with the United States, so unlike the old Socialist Party opposition, which had rejected uh, the U.S.-Japan security alliance, there was none of that. Um, they basically argued that there was, uh, it had now reached the time for a true uh, post-Cold War uh, environment to take, to take hold uh, in Northeast Asia, that the security structure needed to be re-examined and realigned uh, in accordance with uh, the changes, the post-Cold War changes. And that included uh, the reduction over a period of time in U.S. force levels uh, in Japan, 
Uh, and in Okinawa in particular, from the very beginning, the uh, DPJ took the position that the concentration of U.S. bases on Okinawa was an unfair burden on the Okinawans and it needed to be uh, significantly reduced. In its most extreme formulation, and that was held by its primary founder, uh, Hatayama um, Yukio, uh, he called for the creation of, he called it, a new Ampo without a permanent U.S. military presence. And, and, and he still, actually, I spoke to him just last a few weeks ago, and he still basically holds to this view that eventually the Security Alliance should be able to function without actually a permanent U.S. military presence uh, on Japan. Uh, so th uh, clearly this is a difference from the LDP uh, on security policy. And in other areas as well, I'd say the DPJ was much less enthusiastic about the trend we had seen uh, since the, particularly since the early 90s and the mid 90s, uh, uh, towards the globalizing of Japan's security role in support of U.S. security needs, the LDP under Koizumi was perfectly willing to to lend itself to that to to a large extent. The DPJ supported uh, certain aspects of the globalization of Japanese security role. Uh, DPJ or people who were involved in the DPJ were big supporters of the PKO law in 1992. The use of Japanese forces for uh, peacekeeping operations. Uh, they supported the initial response to 9-11, the dispatch of ships to the Indian Ocean, but they absolutely opposed the war in Iraq from the beginning, and they, and they called for the withdrawal of the uh, maritime forces in the Ocean on the basis that they were no longer there to support the Afghan operations, they were there to support the war in Iraq. So uh, they, they, although some people in the DPJ supported constitutional revision. The party as a whole opposed any revision of the wart of the Constitution, particularly Article 9. Uh, they opposed the reinterpretation of the Constitution to allow for uh, it to include uh, collective security, that is, that Japanese troops could uh, act in some way other simply than in their own self-defense, but could act in support of the United States in a collective security arrangement. The only circumstance under which the DPJ supports the dispatch of Japanese troops overseas is under, is under the auspices of the United Nations in a security, or UN authorized, that, that includes the ISAF uh, in, in Afghanistan, in theory, in theory. Um, I think that in general, DPJ uh, leaders saw the need, believe that the Cold War bilateral security structure could eventually, over an extended period of time, be replaced by regional security structures. And in fact, in 1996, they were already talking about a kind of six-party structure that, already, that came into being later. Um, the advocacy of a East Asian community, and that formulation is actually Hatoyama's formulation, but some, the importance of East Asian regional organization was there in their thinking uh, from the beginning. Some of it took a kind of pan-Pacific form, pan-Asian form, others pan-Pacific. I'd say, as I mentioned earlier, that for the most part, uh, they didn't see this as a anti-US thing or a pro-Chinese thing. Rather, they saw it as a way of reasserting Japanese leadership uh, in the region uh, and, and in some ways as a form of kind of soft uh, containment or management uh, of China's aspirations. Um, and this, I, it depends on who you talk to in the DPJ. Some people are more sophisticated about this than others. The DPJ also took a very different stance towards Japan's wartime past than the LDP. The LDP's views on this are dominated by its right wing, uh, which tends to have, a, in some cases, an openly revisionist view of the wartime period defense of Japan's imperial uh, actions. The DPJ sees the need for Japan to deal much more forthrightly with its wartime past in its relations with its Asian neighbors, and that's a very, uh, they, they called for a creation of a national cemetery to replace the Yasukuni Shinto Shrine, for example. So th those are areas of, of, of clear difference. I, I, I've labeled this outlook uh, the new Asianism because in some ways it's rooted in a deep debate that's been going on in Japan since the Meiji era. Are we part of the West? Are we part of Asia? Uh, Asianism in Japan has taken many forms, some of them an imperialist form, but also an anti-imperialist form, if you go back to the thinking of, say, Ishibashi Tanzan uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I, I think the DPJ sort of harkens back to that kind of anti-imperial Asianist tradition uh, in Japan, um, and, uh, but in a, obviously in a very different uh, post-war context, that is the context of Japan's defeat in World War II, which remains, I think, the, in some ways, the overarching backdrop for any discussion of Japanese foreign policy. Um, the, so 
this view was the consensus of the core group of people who began to meet uh, semi-secretly, actually, in 1995. They, they met in a hotel suite uh, near the diet, uh, starting at, at least they reserved the room at 11 o'clock at night, and they would meet till 11, till 1 or 2 in the morning because they didn't want reporters to find them. And that core group of people was Hatayama, his brother uh, Kunio Hatayama, uh, the socialist governor of, of Hokkaido, Yokomichi, uh, Sengoku, who's now a socialist, who's now the chief cabinet secretary, uh, Kaeda Banri, some other people I don't, I, I don't want to mention right now who were more secret parts of this, with the backing of people like uh, Khan, who's now the prime minister, and Edano. Um, they combined, I'd say, three groups of people, uh, a sort of nationalist, conservative, liberal, if you will, strand that comes out of the LDP, that's Hatayama. And Hatayama, very much, if you go to his office, his personal office, on the wall is a picture of his grandfather, who was the prime minister in the 1950s. His grandfather was, uh, you know, very much concerned about ending Japan's dependence on the United States. Uh, he was the one who tried to, who nor wanted to normalize relations with China, uh, with the PRC. He, want, he normalized relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, he, I think it's that sort of strand of conservative thinking in Japan that's a little more, I'd say, uh, who, who sees the need to end dependence on the U.S. Then, then the other strand uh, are ex-socialists. Um, I'd say these are not the ideological left of the Socialist Party in Japan, which were, were in fact Marxist, but more sort of pragmatic social democrats of a sort of European type. And lastly, uh, sort of civil society activists. That's where Khan comes from and some other people. people uh, Khan actually has no interest and has had never had any interest in foreign policy. So I never actually interviewed him because I didn't think he would be a player. <laughs> uh, wrong about that. So um, then later on, uh, two groups from the LDP or people who came originally from the LDP joined into the DPJ. The Mayahara group, Mayahara is now the foreign minister. It's probably more... I'd say closer to the Yoshida consensus in Japanese foreign policy, more pro-U.S. Uh, security alliance-centric, I'd say, uh, much more skeptical about China, and then the Ozawa uh, group. And, but I'd say in large part, although there are differences there, they all shared, I think, broadly uh, this consensus about foreign policy. Now, let me just say a couple of things. I don't want to go on for too much longer. The, the U.S. reaction to this was, uh, t there were two, two reactions to the coming to power of the DPJ. One was the uh, kind of the uh, don't worry reaction that said, okay, you know, there are some differences here, but they're not that big of differences. They're still basically a broad consensus in Japanese foreign policy that will continue. Whatever problems we have are the problems of transition, uh, although I think Americans kind of saw this as an American transition that is they didn't understand the depth of change that had taken place. Uh, this was a, a, a first-time transition. Uh, and that the, they uh, basically believed that, you know, whatever problems, that eventually the Japanese would revert back to uh, the consensus of the post-war period. The second view was a more alarmist view that saw the DPJ, particularly Hatoyama and Ozawa, as being anti-American, pro-China. Some of that was based on a reading, and in some cases I'd say a misreading of some of Hatoyama's writings, but it's easy to see. I can understand how people reached those conclusions, so I thought they were over, overdrawn. Um, now, all of this has now played out in the last more than a year in a period of incredible turbulence in the U.S.-Japan relationship because we, uh, it ended up focusing on, first of all, the issue of the U.S., uh, the relocation of the U.S. Marine Air Station at Futenma to another part of Okinawa. I don't want to, I'm happy to talk about this issue. I've written about it extensively. I, I, I think that two things went on there. One is that uh, the DPJ is sensitive to domestic politics in a way that has never been the case in Japanese foreign policy before. Japanese foreign policy is much more driven now by having to worry about public opinion, elections, than when it was made by a small group of people in behind closed doors, and you had a one party, one party rule that didn't really, where you didn't have to worry about essentially uh, losing power. So now, and, and that was very true in the case of Okinawa. The DPJ wanted to win elections, they wanted to win elections in Okinawa, and they have always supported uh, the uh, opposition in Okinawa to the relocation of the space. That's been their position since their first party platform was drawn up in 1996. It's not a new position on their part. And they won every seat in Okinawa in the election on the basis of that. Americans thought they should just sort of walk away from, you know, what they had 
pledged in an election campaign. The DPJ didn't see it that way, and that was part of the problem. Uh, the other part of the problem uh, was that, uh, you know, Americans read, probably not incorrectly, that behind this, the narrow issue of the base was the bigger question of a, uh, this desire of the Japanese to rebalance their relationship, to refocus their relationship, and to move towards uh, a significant reduction in the U.S. military presence. And I think that the, the I don't, without getting into details, the, the management of this issue on both sides was, was uh, I, I, I'm going to offer it in my class that I teach on U.S. foreign policy in Northeast Asia as a case study of, of really bad management of alliance relations on both sides. Um, and uh, it, the Japanese side is probably very well documented, but I think you can make a case the Americans didn't do a very good job of it either. All of that then led to a crisis which ultimately led to the downfall of the Hatoyama administration, the change in cabinet. I, it's the first time a Japanese cabinet uh, has fallen over security issues since Kishi uh, in 1960. So it's, it, it's not something that happens very often. Uh, the new government, the Khan administration, I think many Americans have, I think, overinterpreted them as having somehow had a kind of realist uh, moment. They now understand the dangers of the neighborhood they're in. They had the Chonan incident. They had the Chinese. Now they see uh, that they really need the security alliance with the U.S. And they've, you know, they've gone back to that comfortable uh, post-war Yoshida doctrine consensus. I, I don't read it that way. I think the main lesson they learned was the lesson the LDP governments learned and relearned over and over again, which is that you better learn how to handle gaijin uh, or you will lose power in Japan. Uh, so, you know, it's how you, manage your, how you manage your relations with the Americans is really important. It's actually not what you do, because in fact they've done nothing on the Okinawa base issue yet, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that they will not be able to deliver uh, that good in the end. But how you're perceived is very important, including by the Japanese public, uh, and they've understood that. So they, they stick to a certain set of words, and they never di uh, uh, divert from them and just keep repeating them ritually. Uh, U.S.-Japan relations are the keystone of Japanese foreign policy. I heard that from every Diet member I spoke to as like within two seconds of having uh, started a conversation with them. So they got that part down. Um, and, but I think if you look, for instance, at the management of this recentism with China, you'll see that fundamentally they're still committed to uh, a, I'd call it a kind of cooperative engagement with a hedge approach towards China. Um, in the end, Sengoku and the political leadership in the DPJ stepped in to uh, end that crisis. Uh, they took it out of the hands of the bureaucrats. They handled it through political channels. It was DPJ politicians who went to Beijing, created a back channel, set up the basis for, for backing down from this. Uh, so, and I, I'd say that, that it's very important to understand that, that they, I, I think, in some ways, I believe in the United States and Japan really approach China in the same way. That is, both of them see, both of them have a strategy of engagement, fundamentally of engagement with China, in which the security alliance functions as a hedge. Uh, it's a hedge for us, and it's also a hedge for them, but we don't always em employ that hedge in the same way and at the same time. And that, I think, uh, demonstrates to me why, and this is something I felt from the beginning of this change in Japan, we desperately need new channels of dialogue and conversation between uh, the people who are ruling Japan and, and, and the United States because, in fact, probably there's more overlap and consensus than both sides understand. And I emphasize both sides because I, I think the Japanese view of J the United States is by, on the part of DPJ uh, uh, members is pretty poor. Um, uh, I, I, I would hesitate to publish some of the things that uh, people said to me because uh, people would, would their, their eyes would roll in their heads about four times over just at the level of lack of understanding of some basic facts more than anything else. So I think there is a desperate need for strategic dialogue. We seem to understand the need for strategic dialogue with China much better than we understand the need for strategic dialogue with our principal ally. Uh, and uh, that's my sort of policy bottom line that comes out of this. So let me stop. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, so uh, for uh, discussion, we turn to uh, Peter Lorenzen, who is an assistant professor in uh, political science at uh, UC Berkeley. Peter received his uh, PhD degree in economic analysis and policy from uh, Stanford's uh, Graduate School of uh, Business. 
He uh, studies political economy and economic growth uh, with an emphasis on uh, a focus on China, and he specializes in the application of uh, game theories uh, to uh, models. He has recently published a book, uh, Death and Development. So with that, Peter, please comment. Actually, that was just an article. I think there was someone who uh, okay. mis mistyped Sorry. that one for you. But uh, the, the book will come out in a couple of years and will be thrilling. So I hope you all purchase it when, uh, <laughs> when it does get there. Um, so uh, so uh, thanks to Professor Shirk and uh, Professor Snyder for uh, their fascinating comments. Um, I think what I'm going to try to do just to, to kick off the discussion here is to um, talk about some of the parallels between or, or contrasts and, and as well as parallels between uh, the political changes um, in, in China and in Japan and, uh, and how they've kind of played out in, um, in, their, in their foreign relations. Uh, so um, as, uh, as Dan's just been outlining, um, in Japan with the, the DPJ coming into power, there's been sort of a, a shift towards an inc increased populism, less reliance on um, experts who unfortunately had also a, lot, a big knowledge base about how um, how the U.S. and uh, and international politics worked, um, and instead that policy is being made more by people with with an eye to domestic political considerations. Um, although, at least to hear Dan tell it, it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like that. Obviously, we're not going to be happy with the outcomes of this, but it seems like it's almost uh, it's surprising we got away so long with being able to just to deal with experts who happen to think that doing mostly what the U.S. thought was good. Um, would be a great, uh, great policy for Japan, and so to see them, uh, you know, push further links within Asia um, that may not always include uh, the U.S. as uh, as onlooker or as prime mover, um, you know, I'm not that worried about Japanese objectives. That I think that's that's terribly detrimental to us, um, and uh, so so we see sort of that um, move away, uh, sort of move away from the elite and the bureaucracy and move towards populism. In China, we see not the opposite move, but sort of moves in different directions um, uh, if we look at it over time. So uh, first of all, as, as Professor Shirk has outlined, there's, there's certainly been a move across all policy dimensions to be uh, more populist in China. And, and Professor Shirk's talked about this a lot in other, other research, how this plays out in foreign policy. Um, but uh, at the same time, we also see in China sort of a, a development of um, over, over the, sort of the long haul, the past 20 years, um, alongside this shift towards populism, um, a much greater understanding, a much higher quality of elites and a much greater understanding of how uh, the rest of the world works and, and I think generally better channels of communication. Um, so now when you um, meet with, uh, with high level Chinese leaders and espe especially with the diplomats, but um, with other people as well, you know, they've spent significant amounts of time abroad. Um, they've often been educated abroad. Uh, a lot of the, the higher level people, their, their children have gone abroad too. So they sort of, now, now they know how we think and are, are less uh, sort of naively reactionary in a way that they were um, maybe 20 years ago. Um, unfortunately, there's, there is still, you know, so that, that's sort of generally a good thing. They, they, know, they mostly know what we want and, and kind of why we want it and, why, and uh, how we're thinking about things. Um, but unfortunately, that's, that's paired with this need to be responsive to uh, the perceived popular opinion in China. Um, this is a, um, a very real thing, um, which I think is, is illustrated by how, how in fact, um, even, even at the local level, the, um, there's a, a great desire to, to make people happy. And, and the, the, some of the reforms that Professor Shirk has mentioned sort of highlight that. And if you think of, for instance, the transparency reforms um, that have been put into place, now, for instance, um, local level governments have to report daily you know, levels of pollution, um, emissions from firms, and so forth. We, and, but the innovation is not that they have to report it up. It's that now they, they always sort of had to report it up. In principle, if Beijing asked for the information, you were supposed to give it over. Uh, but now they have to report it down. And it seems like Beijing's motivation for doing this is because they know um, if they report, yeah, well, we pollute a lot, but we have high economic growth, the center may not be able to exert leverage to, um, to stop excess pollution at local levels. But um, if they actually have to admit to their citizens in the city, well, you know, we're polluting your water and your children are, are getting sick um, openly, then that's something um, that might potentially raise, uh, um, bring up pressures they can't withstand. 
Um, and similar things are going on with um, uh, interactions with, with the U.S. and with China, where to, to do something that, um, to, if they engage in policies and there's not uh, support from uh, what, whatever is perceived to be the masses of Chinese people, then, then it's a real risk. Um, but still, in general, there, there's, a, there's a shift towards being much more uh, intelligent about, um, about what they're doing. A surprising exception recently, though, is for, and I'd be interested if anyone else has, has some insights into this, was the, uh, I, I think, the reaction to Leo Xiaobo's uh, Nobel Prize, which it seems like there, um, I, I don't know who's, who the Chinese uh, leaders were um, trying to play to, because they seem to have, they've, they attempted to put pressure on the Norwegian government, which is ridiculous and ineffective, and, and I think anyone could have told them that um, they weren't going to change this was ahead of time. They were trying to change who got the Nobel Prize and keep it from going to Leo Xiaobo. Anyone could have told them, I think, um, and I think their own people should have known that you can't tell the Norwegian government to do that. First of all, they had the power. They wouldn't do it after you told them. And secondly, they don't have the power to go and change who's going to get the Peace Prize. Yet they did that um, publicly. And then after the prize, they've taken a very, very um, active uh, line in denouncing Leo, Xiaobo, Leo Xiaobo's prize, which again seems to uh, mostly uh, offend foreigners and then actually domestically doesn't really serve their purposes because no one in China knew who Leo Xiaobo was anyway. He was, he was sort of an obscure, uh, uh, one of the, you know, one of the uh, major activists but still not widely known by people who largely are, um, are unconcerned with uh, political change. Now there's sort of a, a huge amount of dialogue um, and attention being focused on him. So, so this really seems a mystery to me because this doesn't seem driven by any real populist pressure, this need to condemn uh, this, this relatively little known um, activist, uh, nor does it seem to be driven by any kind of intelligent um, foreign policy objective that would be achieved by um, uh, standing up to the Nobel Prize Committee in front of the, the international community. Uh, so I'm, I'm, that's one, that's one, that's, again, that's a major exception, but I think, but on the whole, the, the main trends have been uh, the increase in populism paired with a more sophisticated set of uh, foreign policy uh, elites and elites generally. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, any quick comments maybe from the panelists to uh, Peter before we open things up to the audience? All right, the floor is open. Please, uh, Stan, Stanley. Berkeley, and I have to say that uh, in response to Professor Shirk's uh, discussion that I'm both very excited by it and very depressed by it. I'm excited by it because I think she is absolutely, she's approaching one of the most crippling systemic defects in the Chinese political system. That's something that I've been concerned with for years and looking at what happens with local protectionism and, for, and uh, exerted on the courts. Uh, and, I, and, and I, but I'm depressed because of how long I think it'll take. I, I, I'm, maybe I'm venturing a, a backward prediction. How long I think it'll take to change the political and legal culture uh, at the basic level in order to carry out those reforms. And uh, I, I, I've been working with the Asia Foundation for 10 years. And among the projects I've been working on have been those to encourage public participation in governance, that is, for instance, using hearings at the lowest level. And uh, in conversations last year with cadres at the Fajr uh, Fajr Chu, uh, the, the legal affairs office of the uh, state council, uh, the officials said that they were concerned about lower level officials who were ignoring the, uh, the reforms. Uh, at, locally, at one city last year, uh, I heard a report uh, on the institution of hearing, uh, he hearings uh, in one city and was told that afterwards uh, the people who had participated in the hearings were interviewed and quite a lot of the ordinary citizens said they were not interested in doing it again because they thought the officials wouldn't, weren't listening to them. And the officials for their part, many of them said they weren't interested in the citizens. So I think it's gonna take quite a while. On the other hand, just very quickly, I think there's movement from below. 
uh, I think it's very interesting that Hunan Prov that while the National People's Congress hesitated to adopt an administrative procedure law, that Hunan Province uh, instituted an administrative procedure regulation, and I gather other provinces are experimenting a, as well. And uh, in connection with uh, with populist uh, concern about misgovernment. Uh, I noticed something in yesterday's, in, uh, in yesterday's Financial Times, Jeff Dyer, who writes for the Financial Times and I think is a very good correspondent, was talking about the reaction to uh, the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to Liu Xiaobo. And he said that the pressure for reform is coming not from dissidents, and this is uh, a quote, but from a broader range of sources. There are the well-to-do suburban residents who happily organize large protests when their property rights are affected and make sure television cameras are there to watch them, as well as what he calls a fast-growing legal community trying to build more independent courts. And the article is entitled, Beijing Loudly Lambastes the West While Citizens Quietly Give Thanks. Uh, so that's, that's a faint optimistic note that I will close on. Well, I, I am interested uh, in the provincial uh, efforts to introduce reforms at the provincial level. And I think uh, it would be very, very useful to try to uh, look at a whole set of different types of governance reforms and try to chart where are the interesting efforts going on and trying to see if we can understand what kinds of provinces are really doing this. I know some provinces have reputations for being more reform-minded. Obviously, coastal provinces are more cosmopolitan. Um, you know, Zhejiang has a very good reputation, but there are also things going on in Sichuan. Some, I've heard some Chinese political scientists scoff at them and say that they're not, they're for show and not real and, you know, I don't know, but I think the, to try to look at which province is doing what and what the impacts are is, is definitely the way to go. On the rule of law, that is actually one of the most depressing parts of the whole story, I think, because what I often say to Chinese colleagues is, look, expectations about democratic reform in China are really low. Nobody expects China to become an electoral democracy overnight or start tomorrow or anything like that. But, you know, we care that one, when this does happen, because most intellectuals in China say, oh, this is the direction we're going in, it'll just take time. Um, but if we, it, to be successful, to create a stable democracy, you have to have an independent legal system. And uh, so they talk a lot about rule of law, but the legal system is still completely under the thumb of the Communist Party and local power holders. So that's one of the most discouraging things. And I think it's something, since they have adopted this norm about rule of law, you know, it's definitely important to call them on that. And, uh, you know, basically keep pushing on why they're so worried about giving courts the independence to make their own decisions. Boom out a question uh, without a microphone, I guess, here. Ah. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I was listening carefully to all of this, and a, a kind of a gestalt emerged in my mind, and that is that we're really talking about in all th three societies, and I don't want to uh, misinterpret it, but basically we've got weak political leaders in all three societies weak, not, I don't mean in a personality sense, I mean in their capacity to mobilize all the, the levers. So we basically got weak political leadership in the United States, Japan, and China. 
Um, and we have leaders, and probably partly related, uh, populism gaining strength in all three of these. Uh, and so we have people that aren't, don't have their hands on the levers becoming more mobile, uh, more directed by what they perceive at any moment to be domestic popular opinion. Um, and then you look at the f problems facing the region. How are we going to reconceptualize security structures or adapt them to a new power or two in the region? How are we going to deal with transnational issues, you know, whether it's climate change or health or fisheries or pick your transnational issue? And it just seems to me that if you put those two things together, bigger, more interdependent problems and leaders that are less and less capable of thinking in a connected way because they can't act based on such thinking. I mean, where do, I guess this is a, somewhere between a plea and a, <laughs> and a cry. Where are we looking to the future? Well, I agree with your characterization. I mean, I, I, yeah, we, uh, we were organizing a conference on Japanese politics. It's the second one we've done on political change, and uh, we're having it in, uh, in February, and the title of the conference is One Step Forward, One Step Back. I mean, because we, you know, in Japan, it looked like, wow, great, you know, huge uh, political change, uh, uh, government that had a big majority uh, with a clear, clear vision of what they wanted to do, and within a year, uh, they're incapacitated. Uh, and frankly, you could probably, by end of uh, second week in November, we'll be talking about an incapacitated government in the United States, too. Um, so, I, and I can't speak to China, but I think that it, it is, I think there's the sort of dilemma of our age that I think we have increasing mediocrity and in, and sort of the par paralysis of governance at a time when our problems, uh, you know, are even larger and more interconnected than before. And I, I, you know, in the Japanese case, the only hope you have is somehow they can stabilize uh, their rule and their leadership long enough to begin to sort of carve back towards a uh, some sense of accomplishment. I think we see electorates, at least, in Japan, and I think we saw it in Japan this summer, and I, as I think we'll see it here, that they don't have any patience. Uh, there, there's no, you know, the, there's no leeway given uh, for for deliverance of, of the goods here, and that, that is a huge, that puts massive pressure, I think, for the kind of populism you're talking about, because then you just, you know, you do anything you can to appeal to public well, opinion. Finish the thought. Jiang Zemin looks like a towering figure with Zhu Rongji in the sense of WTO taking on the military out of business. I mean, look at some of the issues he addressed, and and look at the more recent. So, I mean, I think I'm particularly worried in the case of China. Okay. Well, I just would like to flag one impressive achievement on the part of Chinese foreign policy, and that is rapprochement across the Taiwan Strait. I agree. And that was not easy to do, and I think they're doing a very good job. Mm -hmm. I, hmm? I mean, it takes two to tango. Obviously, the Taiwan side deserves a lot of credit, too. But a lot of times in the past, Beijing hasn't been willing to you know, really do anything other than bombast and intimidation. So mm -hmm. this is all very positive. Right. And it takes a kind of discipline, focus on what's China's really, China's national interests, being deaf to public opinion. Very interesting that they've never allowed any demonstrations on Taiwan, about Taiwan issues. Mm -hmm. They allow demonstrations that are anti-Japanese, but I think you know, the Taiwan issue might be even more loaded and they don't dare take the risk. That's what uh, Jessica Weiss would say. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, but in any case, they're pursuing their national interests vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in an effective manner, finally. I mean, there is one other thought, which is that democratization may not be good for the conduct of foreign policy. <laughs> I don't know if that's what so much. I mean, in the sense that, uh, only in the sense that, you know, or at least it makes the conduct of foreign policy much more complicated. It certainly has in the case of Japan. Peter? One thing just that, that I was struck by, actually, I think about this morning, uh, I, I believe following your comments, is that the Chinese kind of have the 
the worst of all possible worlds right now in that they have to be responsive in a populist way, but they don't have the, the convenient scapegoat of letting things die in committee, letting things say, well, I'm a congressman and I'm standing up for you, but then it can disappear in the Senate or get vetoed and all these other things, which, so in the US we have to, we have to be more, we have to be responsive or at least look responsive, but there's a lot of ways for things to not happen when everyone knows that they shouldn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but which also, the in, don't China, have. in China, uh, these tough talk can be a substitute for tough action. So mm -hmm. a lot of what we're all uh, worried about in the last year or so is really tough talk. Um, there isn't that much action. Uh, so, I mean, there are some things, but by and large, it's the foreign ministry spokesman, you know, standing up and... Uh, saying his piece, her piece, and um, uh, so, you know, that's kind of the equivalent of posturing, trying to look like you've got the right position, but not really doing any real damage. In the case of policies toward Asian neighbors in the United States, however, it does, uh, you get these reactions that now, you know, if there is a brain operating in Beijing, then these reactions should lead to a recalibration. So let's watch and see. Please. Dan, I want to push you a little bit more. Um, you seem to me you came awfully close to saying that you believe that the constitutional and the political structure in Japan is simply incapable of leading Japan into the future. Um, I'm, I'm, you didn't say that, but that clearly seemed to me what you were implying. I assume you don't believe that. Um, in the face of lots of evidence to the contrary, um, what still gives you hope that the current constitutional and political institutions and culture can succeed in the face of now two decades of, of pretty much straightforward failure? Well, actually, I mean, I, I greeted the election of the DPJ uh, uh, with a great deal of personal relation, to tell you the truth, because I thought that the Japanese policymaking process had reached a level of just paralysis and stagnation um, long, maybe long ago in some sense, and that the opening towards competitive politics in Japan uh, was a healthy development that it would give the you know policy making process a little bit of a, a jolt and open it up and I still believe uh, that that potential is there and one of the positive sides of the DPJ is first of all they uh, they t had the belief from the beginning that uh, public pol that policy should be discussed in the open uh, it shouldn't be just back Behind, by bureaucrats and elites behind closed doors. So they published these long uh, party manifestos. They're, I mean, a little bit hard to slog through, but they're detailed discussions of policy issues. And that was the first time in Japan we'd actually seen that. So uh, they wanted to make electoral politics more driven by policy rather than you know, the, the networks of personal support that have been, and money that have been the drivers of Japanese politics for so long. So I think ultimately, the more that that becomes the case, and the more that uh, Japanese politicians actually have to talk about issues, think through issues, talk to their constituents about issues, it'll be, uh, I think it'll be for the better um, in terms of uh, Jap Japan actually being able to break through some issues, mainly having to do with domestic reform rather than foreign policy, because those are the real tough issues in Japan, everything from dealing with demographic change and uh, uh, budget, you know, huge budget deficits and uh, agricultural protectionism, all those kinds of things. It, it potentially, along with changes in the uh, allocation of votes between urban and rural areas, there's more power flowing to suburbanites and urban voters away from rural Japan. All, all those have potentially really positive effects, but we're going to go through a pretty clearly a pretty much more difficult period of transition than I think some of us thought would be the case. Um, the other thing I would say, though, maybe this is a little bit to the opposite side, is that, and this came up earlier, I, I, though the, there is a desire on the part of certain of the policy elite, and DPJ certainly reflects that, for Japan to take on more of a global and regional uh, leadership role, I don't 
you know, J Japanese actually, it's true, they're much more inwardly focused now in some ways even than they were uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, 20 years ago we had the, you know, Japan is number one, Japanese were strutting around a lot, but the effect of two years of uh, economic stagnation, slight recovery, then the financial crisis, and then watching the rise of China. It, it has had, a, I think, an effect on the Japanese psyche. And to some degree, younger Japanese, I find, they're more globalized. They're more engaged with the world, actually, in some ways. But they're not interested in uh, going out and leading the world or even leading the region. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out how to cope with China. That's the number one, number two, number three, and number four issue in Japanese foreign policy. Uh, but I don't get a sense, you know, if you talk to Japanese right-wingers who are always constantly preaching anti-China kind of Cold War uh, containment type of rhetoric, you will get a distorted picture of Japanese public opinion. I don't think that's where most Japanese are at. So I don't know how far they're willing to go to, in some sense, some ways they want to be left alone uh, and they want to preserve their society. Uh, in the way that it is, and frankly, if I lived in Japan, I might feel share some of those views myself. It's a nice place to live, so I think there is a little bit of that kind of retreat, if you will. Thank you. We have uh, four minutes left, <laughs> and I see three hands. Uh, one in the back for a while, and then two and three, please. Um, I'm Junji Zhang. I'm a visiting student from Taiwan. And I'm wondering if you, uh, Professor Shen Shep, have any idea about the uh, uh, Premier Wen Jiabao. Why Wen Jiabao will make this speech about political reform at this moment? And does he, did he will ma make any change in CCP? Is my question. Thank all you. All right, thank you. Shall we hear all the questions? Sure. Well, all right, please. Please. So um, I know it's become very, con I, I think the, the dance discussion of the politics of, of Japan was, was very interesting. You know a lot more about DPJ, I, I think, and uh, I learned a lot. But I, I do want to dispute this idea that, that you haven't seen massive changes in Japan. I mean, the, I, I've, you said you started studying Japan 35 years ago. So I have 31 despite my tender years. Uh, and I have to say that, that the, the period between, say, 1995 and, and 2005 was the most rapid period of political change that I ever saw, and, and not by a little bit, by far. You have, um, you have Big Bang, you have uh, electoral reform, that's actually 1993, but it first goes through in 1996. You have a whole series of, of uh, fiscal reforms. You have a whole series of, uh, of competition-oriented ones. I mean, the, the Japanese anti-monopoly law, which was based on the US one back in uh, 1948, finally starts getting enforced and for the real, for real uh, in the 1990s and, and going forward. Uh, I mean, I, I think that we can go on down the line and say what the Japanese government has singularly failed to do is to get the economy going again. And that's, we haven't figured out exactly how to do that, but, uh, and I think that's what they're getting blamed for. But, but there's, um, you know, I think the DPJ kind of had it wrong in blaming the bureaucrats. And it's a very attractive thing to do, and the LDP would do it every once in a while too. But the, the bureaucrats were not, not all the bureaucrats were the problem. Bureaucratic policymaking per se wasn't the problem. And I would even dispute the idea that you didn't have party, you know, detailed manifestos. It's just that they weren't attached to a party. I mean, if you look at what Hashimoto came up with, with the, you know, the, the, the six great reforms, for example, okay, so it's put out on behalf of the cabinet, but it's an LDP party platform. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, uh, again, I, I think that, that you have it all right on the politics, but in terms of this particular question of, of why Japan can't get it going, the, the level, of, as I said, the level of change has been enormous, but the, the challenges, the particular challenges are ones that are, are very difficult uh, to get around, and, and uh, as you say, people are getting very impatient about it. Uh, and that makes me as nervous as it makes you. Thank you. And uh, Donald, please. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure, but that the sort of Kremlinological explanation for this latest hard line in Chinese policy may be the most persuasive, whether it's, you know, when versus who or the PLA uh, sounding strident. Um, but academics always have a temptation to sort of uh, 
generalize into realms of ideology and theory. And it strikes me that if, I mean, this is a very dangerous exercise, I suppose, and also full of hubris, but if we put ourselves in the position of the Standing Committee of the Politburo inside Beijing, and we assume that they're really smart people, they must realize the reaction uh, to some of the latest statements. I mean, with regard to the Senkakus, essentially what they've done is to cause Japan now to want to reinforce its security relationship with the United States, right? So if we can assume, and maybe I'm wrong, I mean, you're the expert, uh, that there is a sense that you know, going down this road maybe have short-term advantages, but in the long run, if China really does want to become a major leading power in the world, it can't really afford to alienate the neighbors quite as blatantly as it has done. That would be the rationale. Okay, and then you ask yourself, well, populism, what is, what is populism? Does Cesar Chavez have a role here? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, there is one absent sort of thought, and that's the Beijing consensus. We haven't talked about it. We know that the Chinese are proliferating Confucius Institutes uh, around the world, including in the United States. We know that they have uh, some sort of rhetorical commitment to harmony, right? And it's fairly easy to think that in the wake of the American financial crisis, I mean, think of what happened as a consequence of the Asian financial crisis back in 1997. We had the Chiang Mai Initiative. It, it gave a tremendous stimulus to the growth of East Asian regionalism. And we have the American crisis in 2008, you know, with sort of you know, Wall Street nakedly exposed, it's an opportunity, it seems to me, for the Chinese, not in a blatant way, but sort of a version of USIA during the Cold War, uh, to say, look, you know, we've got a really good model. We're, we're, not, we're not just sort of slaves of the market. Uh, we are balanced, we are harmonious. The state has a role in the economy, right? And look, we've grown, you can't deny that, at a tremendous rate. You too can get aboard. Singapore would line up. <laughs> I'm not sure how many others would, but what do you think? All right, thank you. So two minutes each, please. Uh, Wen Jiabao's speech, I really am mystified. I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, some people in China say that he's concerned about his legacy and that he wants people to know that he really tried to move China forward toward political reform, but it was tough, and but his heart was in the right place, you know, because he's kind of reaching the end of his political career. Um, I don't know, but there are certainly the liberals in China who have been uh, demoralized by recent policies, a recent meaning the last decade or more, uh, are uh, heartened because they feel they have a little space to express their ideas now. The other, I guess a more cynical view is Chinese leaders, uh, Hu Jintao has said things that are not that different, actually, in the past. And there, there's a, a Central Committee plenum now and also around the time of uh, National People's Congress, you get this kind of rhetorical recognition of the importance of political reform. Maybe it's just kind of a cynical way to look like we're responsive, this is a nod to all the problems, but meanwhile, we're really not gonna do anything that much about it. I don't know. Um, as to Chinese foreign policy, Beijing consensus, don't get me started. Uh, I just, you know, this is a notion that is mostly Western generated, entirely Western generated, and that, yes, China is interested in improving its international reputation. They're trying to create a 21st century Chinese culture that revives Confucian ideas but it seems pretty shallow. And they're not going around celebrating the virtues of authoritarianism at all, the way the Western, you know, Ramos and Stefan Halper and stuff, they're celebrating, oh, it's so much better, it's decisive, it really works. But the Chinese don't say that themselves. They focus on all the problems they have. 
So I don't see that they're really, uh, you know, they may be feeling more self-confident because China recovered first from the global financial crisis and that I do think this creates a, a demand within China for a more assertive foreign policy rhetoric. But then anticipating the backlash from neighbors and from the United States, certainly many uh, foreign ministry people anticipated, undoubtedly. But if these decisions are being made kind of at a political level, or some of these things are not decisions ever made. It's just military people shooting their mouths off. And, and yet they do it without fear of punishment. So some people in China say that the military cannot um, dictate the policy, but the civilian leaders can't stop the military from saying and doing things. So that's kind of a delegation relationship that's not working. That could be a description of the United States. Isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I just I would just say I, I absolutely actually I agree with you uh, about change in Japan. I, I, I think j not an unchanging society, not at all. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. But it does change slowly. I mean, I, I believe that the LDP the, the, the Japanese political order, the post-war political order, which I think is intimately linked to the Cold War system as well as to Japan's economic period of economic growth, that came to an end uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, really. And you could see it on the political side at that point, yet the LDP managed to, after seven months of a brief inter interregnum of a coalition government, regain power and hold it for more than 15 years. Uh, you know, they had to adapt, and they had to they had to be more, be more reformist. They had to share power with other parties, uh, but they managed to keep uh, that political structure alive for a lot longer, frankly, than a lot of us thought in the early '90s. So, um, a change did come, it, but it it, it 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 it's a it's a, it's a society and a system that doesn't reward revolutionary change. Uh, the Japanese don't seek it; they're not comfortable with it. It, it rewards incremental change. And sometimes that uh, causes tension with the outside world. Uh, ironically, we're at a moment where you actually have kind of a little discontinuity, and uh, the people seem more alarmed than anybody else are Americans. So who knows what, how to interpret that. All right, so on that very cheerful note, um, thank you. Our thanks to the panel. And uh, we'll take a 10-minute uh, uh, break.